All right, um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so good afternoon uh, or good morning, everyone, depending on your geographical location. Uh, my name is Ram Dasgupta. I'm a senior group leader at the Genome Institute of Singapore. Uh, and it's my absolute pleasure to serve um, as a host today for this third installment of the France Singapore Science and Innovation Lecture Series. Um, so this initiative uh, resulted from the recognition that bilateral cooperation between France and Singapore must continue to be strengthened, especially in the priority areas such as AI, infectious disease, economy and innovation. And consequently, this is really a collaboration between the French Embassy in Singapore, the Collège de France um, and the NRF, the National Research Foundation in Singapore, uh, which launched the first of this lecture series in 2019. Uh, and this is essentially a continuation of that effort. Uh, so let's get started with the program. Uh, it is my honor to introduce the French ambassador to Singapore, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Marc uh, Evansior. Uh, Mr. Evansior um, is a career diplomat serving multiple portfolios, um, including inspector of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the diplomatic advisor to the Ministry of Defense. And earlier in his career, the first secretary of the French embassy in China uh, and subsequently in the United States. Um, he was appointed the ambassador of France to the Republic of Singapore in, the November, in November of 2016. Um, his professional experience mainly covers Asian affairs. Uh, in fact, he was an exchange student in the Department of East Asian Studies at Harvard um, in the mid nineties. Um, Mark is a former student of the Ecole Normale Supérieure um, from which he graduated as associate professor in philosophy. Uh, so without, uh, without any further ado, I would like to welcome Mr. Watsio to give the opening remarks for this conference. Mark. Thank you very much and thank you for your kind, uh, kind words. Uh, Professor Patrick Tan, uh, Monsieur le Professeur Hugues de Té, ladies and gentlemen, bonjour. I'm delighted to open this inaugural uh, lecture of the France-Singapore Science and Innovation Lecture Series 2020-2021. This uh, lecture series was launched as a result of the France-Singapore Year of Innovation in 2018 and 2019. And it's presented jointly by the, the French Embassy in Singapore and the Collège de France and the National Research Foundation here in Singapore. This uh, lecture series started in 2019 and consists of presentations from eminent professors from France in Singapore and from Singapore to France. Hence, we had the honor to welcome in Singapore last year, Professor Philippe Sansonetti, a worldwide renowned researcher in microbiology and infectious disease, whose work has been particularly valuable in gaining a better understanding of the crisis we are all confronted to. Early January, Professor Alain Fischer, Chair of Experimental Medicine at Collège de France, shared also about his work on curative approaches of gene therapy. Three other professors of Collège de France will participate to this second series in the coming month. Professor Anne Chung, Chair of Intellectual History of China, in February 2021. Professor Thomas Lecuy, Chair of Dynamics of Living Systems in April 2021. And Professor Pierre-Michel Menger, Chair of Sociology of Creative Work in June 2021. So I would like now to express my deep gratitude to our speaker today, Professor Hugues de Té, who accepted to give this lecture online. Uh, and we hope very much to have the opportunity in a not too far uh, future uh, to welcome you in Singapore. I would also uh, like to express my thanks to Professor Patrick Tan for welcoming this uh, lecture at the Genome Institute of uh, Singapore. And uh, as you uh, said, I mean, this event today is part of the 2020 edition of Voila, French Singapore Festival which is uh, still going on till November uh, 22nd. And this year, the festival gathers uh, 50 programs covering culture, education, science, and uh, lifestyle, and is placed under the symbolism of resilience, innovation, 
and it's also an opportunity for us i mean to experiment new formats for uh, events and lastly last but not least to reaffirm also the friendship between our two countries uh, as you may know we are commemorating the 55th anniversary of the diplomatic ties between france and singapore and france was among the first countries to recognize singapore in 1965. so i uh, without uh, further ado i mean uh, i uh, invite uh, professor Hugues de Té and to uh, take the floor and i wish you a very enjoyable uh, lecture and uh, fruitful discussion thank you very much Ram, I think you're on mute. Oh, great. Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I would like to now call upon uh, Professor Patrick Tan, uh, our fearless leader and executive director of the Genome Institute of Singapore and professor at the Duke NUS Medical School to deliver his opening address for this lecture series. Uh, Patrick, as most of you are aware of, is leading the precision medicine effort in Singapore through PRISM and directs the Singh Health Duke NUS Institute of Precision Medicine as well. Um, he was trained at, uh, as an undergrad at Harvard and received his MD PhD from Stanford. And he's made some fundamental contributions towards a mechanistic understanding of gastric cancers, of course, internationally recognized by numerous high impact papers, awards and grants. Um, and as he has an elected member of the American Society of uh, Clinical Investigation, as well as, a as well as a board member of the International Gastric Cancer Association. So with that, Patrick, the mic is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ram. And uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, Professor today, it's been a great honor and on behalf of the Genome Institute of Singapore to host your lecture uh, on behalf of France and Singapore. Uh, what I would like to do in the, in the next few minutes is to maybe talk a little bit, very briefly, about the Genome Institute of Singapore and the importance that international connections between countries like Singapore and France require in order to make advances, particularly in the field of cancer research and oncology. So uh, the, we are very happy to host uh, Professor Dutte's uh, lecture today as the Chair of Cellular and Molecular Oncology. Dr. Professor Dutte's work in the understanding the molecular genetics of leukemia is extremely well known, as well as his ability to move between biology and medicine. But the work that he does is very much in tandem with the ethos of the Genome Institute of Singapore, which is to use genomic sciences to improve human health and prosperity. The Genome Institute of Singapore started in the 2000s. We are about 20 years old, so not so young anymore. And we have four major divisions of research, precision medicine, epigenetics, single cell systems, as well as genome architecture and design. We feel that the Genome Institute of Singapore is a very strategic choice for hosting Professor Dutte's lecture today, because his particular field of interest, which is molecular oncology, is also one of the key research focus areas of the Genome Institute. We are very interested in identifying genetic variants related to cancer susceptibility, and we participate in many national consortia related to cancer research, including national scale liquid biopsy programs. Uh, we have expertise in different cancers that are endemic to Asia, such as gastric cancer, lung cancer, and also liver cancer. And I also highlight Professor Ram Dasgupta's recent paper a few weeks ago in Cell, showing the single cell analysis of liver cancer. So congratulations to Ram. Uh, we do believe that by working together, we can improve outcomes for cancer patients by making the right medicine to the right uh, patient, and I think that Professor Dutte's lecture today will be show you a ma magnificent showcase of precision oncology. I also want to highlight that while we are in Singapore, we have ma many different international scientists at the Institute, in fact, several from France. We collaborate with the University Hospital on NGS France in ophthalmology. We work with France Genomic on environmental metagenomics. And the GIS is home to several colleagues from France, for example, Nick Bertin and Maxime Hebran, who are part of our computational biology group. We have PhD students, and we hope that once COVID lifts, many of the participants from France 
will consider coming to Singapore to spend some period with us in research, either for a short stint or perhaps for longer. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Dutte on virtually to Singapore and I'll hand the podium uh, back, back to Ram and Dutte to start today's lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, it is now indeed my great honor to introduce today's speaker, Professor Dutte. Uh, professor Dutte is a professor of molecular oncology um, at the Collège de France and a physician at the St. Louis Hospital um, in Paris. Uh, he is an MD-PhD physician scientist, uh, receiving dual training in medicine and basic sciences, and in fact has been a forefront uh, at the forefront of translation leukemia research. Um, in fact, his research is, is very close to my heart, aimed at linking molecular cell biology to therapeutic responses in cancer. In fact, his classic studies on acute promyelocytic leukemia and the targeting of the PMR. PML retinoic acid receptor alpha by retinoic acid and arsenic has just fundamentally changed the clinical paradigm leading to the cure of this once what is thought to be an intractable disease. Uh, needless to say, these studies have earned him significant international recognition. He's a recipient of numerous awards and grants. Uh, Professor Tate is currently working on improving the therapeutic response on other leukemia through mechanistic elucidation of uh, drug action in vivo. So with that, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Tate to deliver his lecture titled Dissecting the Mode of Action of Targeted Leukemia Therapies. Uh, Professor Tate, the stage um, of this virtual platform uh, is all yours. Really looking forward to your talk. And just a quick reminder to the participants, uh, please use the Q&A chat box at the bottom to ask your questions, uh, which uh, Professor Tate uh, will take at the end of his talk. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Tate. Thank you, Ram. Uh, let me check this. Okay. Well, it's a great pleasure, pleasure and honor uh, to give this lecture uh, in Singapore, even virtually. And I very much hope too uh, that once the sanitary situation improves, I will have a chance uh, to visit the Genome Institute, uh, a place which I would very much like uh, to visit. I would also like to express uh, my gratitude to the French, to His Excellency, the French Ambassador to Singapore, uh, Marc Abinsour, uh, to the National Research Foundation, as well as to the Genome Institute of Singapore and its uh, director, uh, Patrick Tan. So uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I will give you a, a, a personal view of, of cancer research, which has really been uh, driving uh, driving my, my work uh, for the, the past uh, 30 years. And I will not talk so much about uh, technological uh, driven uh, cancer research, uh, such as omics, deep sequencing, single cell genomics, artificial intelligence, functional genomics, uh, organoids, metabolism, because I think that my colleagues in Singapore are probably much more educated uh, than I am in, in this respect. Uh, these, uh, these are developed in, very, in centers with very strong industry connections and broadly the results are correlated to, to the investments. However, what we have learned uh, from, the, uh, from the past 20 years is that, oh, sorry. is that uh, targeted therapies are not necessarily uh, curative and that we need more uh, than identifying a target and, and, and a, a drug uh, to cure cancer. What we need really is actually uh, understanding the mechanisms. And the classic example of Gleevec or imatinib uh, is, is summarized here uh, with two, two uh, pictures, one from time saying, you know, here we have the magic bullet that will cure all cancer. And almost 20 years later, a review by one of the key actors in, in the BCR Abelson story, uh, Brian Druck, uh, Drucker, showing that we have actually have response, but that these are, are uh, transient and we have acquisition of resistance so that we really have to elaborate a, a target, a strategy uh, to overcome uh, these resistance and to get uh, cancer eradication. And so I'd like to make the case uh, that most paradigm changing discoveries uh, were made by chance. Uh, 
and uh, not so many examples of a priori design breakthroughs. Uh, and just to remind you that history is often rewritten because even Gleevec was not initially designed as a, an able uh, inhibitor. And what I'd like to do today is to share a personal perspective based of 30 years of translational and basic cancer research uh, showing that curiosity-driven, unexpected observations starting from patients can also be a way to get into cancer biology. And naturally, the fact that we start uh, from clinical observations uh, will ensure uh, ultimately clinical relevance. I'd like also to stress that actual cellular and, cellular and molecular mechanisms for therapy response are important. And I'd like to argue that there are not many examples where we understand the mechanisms in depth and, when those and where those mechanisms are linked to clinical efficacy. And uh, I'd like to make a bet uh, that at least some of the future breakthroughs will rely on this type of approach, starting from unexpected clinical observation, constructing uh, cellular and molecular biology from these observations, and then getting back to clinic. So what I'm going to talk about today is acute promyelocytic leukemia, a disease that was uh, described in the late 50s uh, by a Norwegian clinician, described to as the most uh, vicious, the most fatal of all leukemias, because uh, in those days, most patients uh, would die a, a couple of weeks only after diagnosis was made. The first breakthrough was made by an American cytologist, uh, Janet Rowley, who described a, chromo a recurrent chromosomal translocation between chromosome 15 and 17, uh, which was the molecular hallmark of this disease uh, and led to the definition of this disease by cytogenetic uh, means. And finally, uh, the last element uh, was the observation by clinicians in the US uh, that, that retinoic acid, a hormone uh, that was at the time investigated uh, because of its activity on many uh, embryonic stem cells, and uh, notably uh, the, the F9 or the HL60 model, could trigger terminal differentiation of primary APL cells ex vivo. And this uh, was uh, the driving force uh, for the uh, experimentation in, in patients by Wang Zhanghe and his colleagues in Shanghai and uh, of the effect of retinoic acid directly in patients, uh, largely because in those days, the Chinese clinicians had no other opportunity, no other choice. And he was able to make a re remarkable contribution demonstrating that, that retinoic acid could induce uh, clinical remissions uh, leading to a, from shifting the bone marrow uh, from a purely leukemic state to a normal state. And this uh, led us in, in cooperation with clinicians in uh, the, the Saint Louis Hospital in Paris, notably Laurent de Gauss, uh, to demonstrate uh, that the retinoic acid receptor gene was the target of the 1517 translocation. Uh, so what, what does this look like morphologically? Well, morphologically, uh, this is a representation of leukemic cells prior to diagnosis. And this is the, what happens after two weeks of retinoic acid. All these cells are still leukemic in origin, uh, but as you can see, they are differentiating uh, towards granulocytes. And granulocytes are extremely short-lived uh, cells. And these short-lived cells uh, will be cleared away so that after a few more weeks, uh, the bone marrow will be replaced uh, by normal, uh, normal cells. So this looked uh, like a miracle. It was uh, uh, promoted as differentiation uh, therapy. Uh, the bad news is that these responses are often transient, most often transient, and that with very rare exceptions, uh, all those patients relapsed. And so uh, in Saint Louis Hospital, Laurent de Gauss, uh, initiated a few years later, a combined retinoic acid anthracycline uh, therapy, uh, which induced cure of a substantial number of patients. 
And so, as I was mentioning, this led to the molecular identification of the molecular hallmark uh, of APL, the 1517 translocation, uh, wherein uh, through this chromosomal translocation, a fusion protein uh, will be generated between the retinoic acid receptor alpha gene and a gene that we named PML for promonocytic leukemia, creating a pml rer fusion protein, uh, which is really the main driver uh, the, of uh, transformation in vivo or ex vivo. So uh, retinoic acid receptor alpha is a retinoic acid responsive uh, nuclear receptor. Uh, so it's a transcription factor that which can be switched on and off uh, with retinoic acid. And PML is, as we'll see, uh, the organizer of nuclear domains, uh, which are controlling many, many aspects, including senescence, uh, at least in part through P53 control. And naturally, retinoic acid will bind PML RER through the ligand binding domain of the RER moiety of the fusion, so that historically, uh, retinoic acid activity in P on PML RER positive APL uh, was probably the first example of targeted therapy. So the first model which was proposed and which is still in many textbooks uh, is the following, is that uh, PMLRER binds DNA uh, together with a poorly characterized transcriptional co-repressor complex and silences genes induced in uh, differentiation. And so this uh, transcriptional silencing is responsible uh, for the differentiation arrest. And in the presence of retinoic acid, uh, the binding of retinoic acid to PMLRER will transform this repressor into a potent activator, and the activation of differentiation genes will induce differentiation of the leukemic cells towards granulocytes, which are cells uh, that will be naturally eliminated. So this uh, really became a textbook model uh, for transcriptional-based differentiation therapy, and everyone thought uh, that the story was closed. Except that there was the comeback of uh, Peter Herlich magic bullet uh, arsenic, uh, which he developed for infectious disease, and which was also developed in China uh, in Huijing Hospital uh, by uh, Zhu Chen and Wang Zhenghe. And what they could find in uh, relapsed uh, patients who have relapsed from retinoic acid resistance is that there was clinical response uh, at very high, very high efficiency, over 95% complete remissions. And as you can see on this image, uh, the uh, morphological aspects of uh, arsenic-treated um, APL patients, this is a bone marrow sample taken uh, maybe uh, 10 days after arsenic, uh, in, af after arsenic therapy. And as you can see, the images are essentially undistinguishable uh, from those of patients treated with retinoic acid. And uh, this differentiation in vivo is accompanied, in fact, in contrast to retinoic acid, uh, by a very high curative efficiency, uh, which uh, from uh, clinical studies performed in India and in the Iran was actually estimated to be a 70% definitive cure using arsenic as a single agent without retinoic acid and without chemotherapy. And so the reason why we established a very tight uh, collaboration with my friend uh, Chen Su at the Shang in Shanghai was that it immediately became apparent to us uh, that this was completely incompatible with the transcription-based model because arsenic does not do anything uh, onto uh, retinoic acid signaling. And so that this simple model of transcriptional reactivation uh, by retinoic acid leading to differentiation uh, was uh, at, at best uh, insufficient to explain uh, its activity and totally in impossible to explain the clinical efficacy of arsenic. And so this led uh, my group and a number of others uh, to refocus on PML, uh, which had, was really uh, the constant partner of the fusion on which very little was known at the time. And as you can see on this image uh, taken from, from a, a review, is that PML uh, can form those bodies, those nuclear structures, uh, which we envision as uh, shells uh, for uh, post-translational modification of proteins. 
And by proteins, I mean a very large number of partner proteins, which are represented here, uh, some very well known, such as P53, Sumo, DAX, SP100, uh, will be recruited by PML into uh, these bodies. And subsequent work from my lab has shown that in these bodies, they will undergo post translational modification and particularly sumo conjugation, sometimes followed uh, by degradation. And so uh, what was discovered, and this is a really a historical slide, is that PML RER has the ability uh, to deorganize PML bodies uh, from this shell, uh, empty shell, which you can see here by immunoelectron microscopy or superillumination microscopy, uh, where uh, PML will concentrate those partner proteins and physiologically, it was shown uh, by the group of Pellici in Milan that this is key in controlling uh, P53 activation and senescence. And uh, PML RER disrupts PML nuclear body. This is an image of a transfectant cell. These are normal PML bodies in non-transfected cells. And when you transfect PML RER, you have this microspeckled patterned, uh, which we propose could be used for diagnosis, and it actually is in many countries. And this was shown uh, by uh, Pier Giuseppe Pellici to blunt P53 signaling and to induce apoptosis and senescence resistance. And remarkably, uh, we're able to show uh, that these are primary uh, APL blasts taken from a patient treated in St. Louis, and when you treat the patient with either retinoic acid or arsenic, these cells, which are still leukemic cells, will undergo this reformation of PML nuclear bodies. And this reformation of PML nuclear bodies is in fact the reflection of PML RER degradation by retinoic acid or by arsenic. Thus, in contrast to, to the model of transcriptional control, which was only uh, valid uh, for retinoic acid, uh, degradation of PML RER by arsenic or by retinoic acid was the only shared uh, feature between those two clinically active drugs. And so we made the bet uh, with my, my friend Chen Su that there was a role of PML RER degradation in response and that reformation of PML nuclear bodies was likely contributing to the clinical efficacy of these two drugs. You have to understand that 25 years ago, uh, this was a very obscene proposal and that everyone was so persuaded that transcriptional control was key to biology that proteolysis, uh, arguing that drug-induced proteolysis could have any clinical activity, was not very well received by the community. And so, uh, we took uh, the efforts of going into the biochemistry of this degradation to understand it. Uh, this was done uh, by Valérie Lallemand of Breitenbach in my lab. And to make a, a long story short, uh, retinoic acid will bind uh, to its hormone binding pocket in the RER part of PML RER, triggering uh, reorganization of the um, uh, uh, by allosteric reorganization uh, of protein uh, structure, recruiting the proteasome and driving proteasome mediated degradation of RER alpha or PML RER. This is a general mechanism, a general feedback mechanism, which is shared uh, for all nuclear receptors, uh, probably to ensure cessation of transcriptional activation. And this was discovered uh, by uh, Jun Su in the lab. And binding of arsenic to PML on the site that we had identified here in one of the B, one of the zinc fingers triggers a complex sequence series of events, which is just summarized here, where we have oxidation of PML through direct arsenic binding, polymerization of PML and nuclear body aggregation to create this external shell uh, of uh, PML nuclear bodies, which drives then the uh, conjugation of PML uh, by the sumo ubiquitin-like peptide, and then polysumulation of PML or PML RER will drive recruitment of an enzyme, which is a sumo-dependent ubiquitin ligase called RNF4, which will trigger polyubiquitination and recruitment of the proteasome and degradation by the proteasome. So it's very remarkable that those two drugs that were found by chance through clinical empirism actually have the 
shared property of binding directly to PML RER and triggering a set of biochemical events that will result in uh, proteasome mediated degradation of the fusion. And so I think it should be clear from this presentation that arsenic also targets the normal PML protein. And you can see here this normal PML protein and note here that you have a substantial amount of the protein which is present diffusely in the nucleus. Uh, and this diffuse nuclear fraction of PML will be recruited onto these very large nuclear bodies very rapidly, literally within minutes after arsenic exposure, and then will be uh, followed by PML uh, degradation uh, onto, these, uh, onto these bodies. Okay, so there was a very long contention in the APL, in the leukemia uh, world, uh, of whether transcriptional activation or degradation uh, were essential. And as often, uh, it's the use of mouse models that was able uh, to decipher between those two possibilities. And the first, uh, the first observation was that we could have genetic uncoupling of differentiation and leukemia clearance. And this was made by comparing in animal models uh, PML RER driven APL, this is the standard classic APL, 97% of APL uh, cases, and uh, very rare cases of APL, which uh, are called uh, atypical uh, uh, variant APLs, where the fusion partner of RER alpha is another gene uh, called uh, PLZF. And PLZF RER generates uh, a leukemia, which is uh, known to be. Uh, insensitive, uh, resistant to retinoic acid. And in these mouse models, what we're able to show is that after retinoic acid treatment of the animal, we have a first phase of differentiation and then replacement by the normal bone marrow as soon as day seven, as you can see here. And this replacement of the leukemia by the normal bone marrow, uh, of course, will be accompanied by the loss uh, of uh, the PML RER fusion in the bone marrow. Now, if we go to the PLZF RER variants, we can see, in fact, that we have full differentiation. We transform an immature leukemia into um, granulocy granulocytic uh, CML-like disease. Uh, but of course, as expected by the absence of recovery of the normal bone marrow, this uh, differentiated population is still entirely leukemic uh, because they all harbor uh, the PLZF RER fusion. So this provided a provocative experiment that differentiation was not necessarily associated uh, to disease clearance and that it was likely that there would be two separate steps in the clinical response. And so this was the first, uh, the first uh, um, problem with the differentiation therapy model. The second uncoupling uh, was uh, pharmacological, uh, where again, we used a number of synthetic retinoids uh, represented here as NRX or acetretin. And we found out that those, uh, those uh, atypical retinoids shared the ability to induce differentiation, shared the ability to induce transcriptional activation of the targets, but failed uh, to degrade PML RER, which is not shown here. Uh, and as a result of the failure of degradation of PML RER, uh, clonogenic activity in methyl cellulose was maintained, implying that in this system, we had differentiated the bulk of the leukemic cells, but we had not affected the leukemic stem cell phenotype and that there was still a, a very a small proportion of leukemic cells which remain fully clonogenic uh, despite reactivation of PML RER, uh, but in the absence uh, of uh, PML RER uh, degradation. So this was a second very strong evidence that transcriptional activation and differentiation was not the driver uh, for response in APL. But the final experiment uh, really came from very close, careful modeling in, in mouse models uh, done uh, by Julien Ablin, who was at the time a PhD, a very brilliant PhD uh, candidate in the lab. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, using a variety of mouse models, was he, what he was able to show is that transcriptional reactivation of target genes is responsible for differentiation. Degradation of PML RER through the reformation of PML nuclear bodies and the activation of P53 
was responsible for loss of self-renewal. And this, of course, uh, was uh, demonstrated uh, also by the use of leukemia APLs, PML RER driven APLs, in which the PML alleles uh, was excised or in which the P53 allele was excised. And in these variant leukemia in mouse models, we keep the differentiation arm, but there was no loss of self renewal and therefore there was no, uh, no therapeutic efficacy of the drug. And the same model actually holds true uh, for arsenic. Uh, we have uh, differentiation by passive reactivation of target genes through the disappearance of PML RER, the clearance uh, of target promoters allows the reactivation of PML uh, RER uh, target gene passively. And the, the reformation of PML nuclear bodies, again, will activate P53 and allow so loss of self you. So there was a hunting question in the field, which was to know uh, whether the two drugs would be synergistic or antagonistic. And uh, taking, uh, taking differentiation as an endpoint, it was very clear that in cell lines or primary patient samples, as shown here, uh, the differentiation activa the activation of differentiation by retinoic acid was in fact antagonized by arsenic with lower amounts, as you can see, of differentiation markers such as CD11B or CD11 or SC. Uh, so for a while, clinicians uh, kept the drugs apart from each other uh, with the assumption that they were antagonistic for differentiation. However, exploration of mouse models uh, showed uh, the reverse. Uh, as summarized here, um, when uh, we treat with arsenic or with retinoic acid, we somehow prolong survival, but we never cure the disease. This is accompanied uh, by massive regression of the leukemia, as you can see here from in vivo imaging. But if we treat uh, for only uh, three weeks with the uh, retinoic acid and arsenic combination, we have a dramatic synergy for the elimination of the disease despite the antagonism for differentiation. And this massive synergy for the elimination of the disease is accompanied uh, by the cure uh, of all mice. And so this was a very important experiment uh, 20 years ago, which led to uh, clinical trials uh, that tested the association of retinoic acid and arsenic. Uh, the first trials were done in Shanghai. Uh, this is a result from the, the randomized, uh, randomized clinical trial performed in Europe uh, by the late uh, Francesco Lococo. And as you can see, retinoic acid and arsenic in standard risk patients has a, a very, very favorable uh, pro survival profile when compared to the historical retinoic acid plus chemotherapy treatment. I should stress that in contrast to kinase inhibitors, all patients get off treatment uh, after six months. And the work performed in China uh, by a number of different investigators have shown that oral therapy with arsenic sulfur combined to oral retinoic acid has exactly the cl same uh, clinical impact so that the disease can be essentially cured uh, with two pills a day uh, for uh, six months or so. So this, of course, was a major achievement. I should say that after a couple of years, it became uh, the gold standard treatment for APL all over the world. Uh, and this led us to the discovery that PML was the driver uh, of uh, response, uh, which actually we did not know when we published uh, the synergy between retinoic acid and arsenic. Well, this uh, observation of the key role of PML in therapy response uh, led us to uh, rethink about the possible mechanisms. And I should say that Chen Su and I had written a large number of reviews saying that the synergy between retinoic acid and arsenic was most likely mediated by a synergistic effect on PML RER degradation. Indeed, biochemically, the two degrants are different, uh, so that retinoic acid and arsenic induced uh, PML RER degradation is synergistic uh, through the combined uh, activation of the two degradation pathways. However, I demonstrate, I showed to you that the effector of therapy response is PML, 
and that arsenic directly acts on PML. And this uh, can be shown here uh, in these uh, cells taken from mouse APL cells taken from six hours after in vivo treatment, where you see this beautiful reformation of PML nuclear bodies, even though the degradation uh, of uh, the PML RER, which is in green here, is not yet complete. But despite this not incomplete degradation, we have this remarkable reformation of PML bodies. And this suggested uh, that they could be, uh, together with the degradation, a direct effect of arsenic on the normal PML allele, and that this enforcement of nuclear body reformation formation by arsenic activity on the normal PML allele could contribute to therapy response. And this, again, uh, was demonstrated when studying patients. And uh, the study of these patients demonstrated uh, that arsenic resistance could be linked to highly clustered mutation on the arsenic binding site of PML RER, uh, which is represented here. Uh, cysteine, uh, arsenic binding residues in many protein are highly clustered cysteine residues. And here you can see that in this zinc finger, we have three cysteine residues. And in particular, arsenic is particularly vividly bound to adjacent cysteines. And there was a, a single D-cysteine uh, residue in PML, which we proposed to be the binding site. And indeed, uh, in artificial models, if we bind any of these two cysteines, we abolish um, uh, arsenic binding. And we were uh, delighted when a Chinese group, a couple of months later, reported in their arsenic-resistant patients uh, very highly clustered mutations uh, surrounding these three cysteines, as you can see here, uh, which are therefore on-target mutations conferring, impairing uh, arsenic binding and PML uh, polymerization. And I should stress that these were historical patients who had not benefited from the frontline arsenic-retinoic uh, acid combination, probably explaining why uh, they uh, did relapse uh, with arsenic uh, single agent. However, uh, what we reported a couple of months later in the New England Journal of Medicine was the same hotspot mutation. Actually, the most prevalent mutation here is this valine residue, which replaces the alanine residue. And the mutation in the patient whom we described was on the PML allele and not on the PML RER allele. And uh, in that patient, the PML RER allele was not mutated. And therefore, the occurrence of a mutation in the arsenic binding site of the normal PML uh, allele in that patient established genetically uh, the uh, key role of PML uh, binding uh, by arsenic in therapy response. And so this led us uh, to uh, perhaps the ultimate model of APL uh, uh, treatment by retinoic acid and arsenic wherein retinoic acid and arsenic will trigger independently PML RER degradation by activating those two degrons. Uh, but at the same time, arsenic will activate, uh, bind to the normal PML allele and activate nuclear body reformation uh, prior to the ultimate uh, degradation of the PML protein. But for a couple of hours, we'll have massive PML nuclear body reformation. And this will activate P53, also probably trigger other pathways, including uh, the E2F uh, that was shown in, in, in some other experiments in fibroblasts. And these senescence markers, then the senescence effectors, P53 and E2F, will induce loss of self-renewal, at least in part through senescence, and direct uh, the cure uh, of APL. And naturally, uh, this scheme now very naturally explains the clinical potency of arsenic, uh, because in contrast to retinoic acid, which only acts on PML RER and clinically is not sufficient to eradicate the disease, uh, definitively, it only does it transiently, arsenic via its dual activity to trigger PML RER degradation and PML nuclear body reformation will induce uh, the full uh, loss of self-renewal, which explains why, as I mentioned earlier, 70% uh, of patients can be definitively cured uh, by single-agent uh, arsenic. Quite a remarkable observation. So, <clears throat> how is P53 activated? 
Well, the answer actually is for the moment we don't know. Uh, what we know is that P53 uh, can be recruited inside uh, those PML, uh, this PML shell. And this PML shell uh, work from my lab, which I will not discuss today, uh, is envisioned really as a post-translational modification factory, at least in part through the recruitment of the key enzyme, the key uh, E2 enzyme of sumolation, UBC9, and also its uh, ARF cofactor. And all of the modifiers of P53, HOSP, HIP, K2, uh, MDM2, ARF, DAX, uh, you name it, you have it, they will all concentrate in PML nuclear bodies, uh, at least transiently, together with P53. And so we see uh, these uh, stress-induced uh, bodies, um, because uh, not only arsenic, but actually any type of oxidative stress can induce the formation of these nuclear bodies. This will recruit P53 and all its modifier enzymes into these bodies where, bodies where P53 will undergo a variety of post-translational modifications that will ensure its full activation before it exits the bodies and goes uh, into chromatin. And indeed, in work that was published in GXMED a couple of years ago, uh, we showed that PML is absolutely essential for oxidative stress-driven P53 activation in normal tissues, not in the leukemic concept, context, but in normal tissues, and that PML is a key regulator of oxidative stress through its ability to undergo oxidative stress-induced uh, polymerization and formation of the bodies and activation of P53, and in particular, the antioxidant function of P53 uh, in uh, normal tissues. I also mentioned that PML controls E2F signaling, but this is not well understood mechanistically at the moment. And so in the last part of my talk, uh, what I'd like to discuss with you is uh, the logical conclusion from the APL story is that if PML nuclear bodies is the effector of therapy in uh, APL, it's possible that it's also implicated in other kinds uh, of uh, malignancies. And uh, we're here faced with a classic question is how uh, can you drug a, a target? Are PML bodies druggable? And the answer is yes. And PML nuclear bodies are quite actually easily druggable uh, through uh, the, active, the ability of interferon to transcriptionally induce uh, the expression of PML. PML is a massive uh, transcriptional target of interferons type 1 or type 2. Actually, sumos are also induced by interferon. And if a cell that has a lot of PML is exposed to arsenic or to other forms of oxidative stress, you will induce uh, the formation of PML nuclear bodies and uh, recruit UBC9 and induce sumolation degradation of partner proteins, uh, which is associated to senescence induction. And this can be visualized here in the mouse, uh, looking at hepatocytes. And these hepatocytes have very few PML bodies in the normal conditions. But after treatment with an inducible an interferon inducer, such as DIC and arsenic trioxide, you see this massive formation of PML nuclear bodies in these normal cells. So independently from the context of PML translocation, we have massive induction of uh, formation of nuclear bodies and therefore also massive induction not shown here of simulation and degradation of partner proteins. So the, uh, the, the, this sequence uh, was actually explored in, uh, with my colleague and friend Ali Bazarbashi uh, in adult T-cell leukemia, uh, a disease uh, prevalent in Japan, Africa, and the Caribbeans due to infection with HTLV-1. And what we were able to show is that induction of uh, interferon and arsenic uh, through this nuclear body formation can degrade uh, some of the oncogene, one of the essential oncogenes of uh, HTL, of tax, uh, the HTLV1 encoded protein tax. Well, we'll not discuss this today. Uh, this was extensively published. This has clinical efficacy in mouse models and to a certain extent in patients. And what I'd like to discuss is very recently uh, published work uh, in 
which in collaboration with a group in Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris and Hôpital Saint-Louis, we studied another disease, uh, myeloproliferative neoplasm, and in particular, those driven uh, by the JAK2 uh, activator mutation, which was discovered in France by William Van Schenker. And we know that this is a key driver oncogene uh, for a variety of conditions, including polycythemia vera and primary, uh, primary um, myelofibrosis. Uh, so uh, these, uh, through the work of Jean-Jacques Kiladjian, uh, also in Paris, it was shown that this disease is sensitive to interferon alpha, uh, long-term administration. And when you look at the, the burden allele in these patients, after months of uh, interferon treatment, you see a progressive decrease in the, uh, in the majority of patients, although the disease is not eradicated, uh, but it's controlled in a large group of patients. And so what we proposed some years ago uh, is that there may be a role of PML in interferon response in this disease. And if there was a role of PML in interferon response, it would be anticipated that they should be a synergistic effect of arsenic. And for this, uh, I'll refer you to the, the, the publication for all of the data, uh, but we mostly use the mouse models, uh, mouse model for the, the disease with a, a JAK2 mute knock-in allele uh, with a GFP uh, marker. Uh, we irradiate animals with bone, normal bone marrow and leukemic bone marrow. So this is really an appropriate model uh, for the human disease with a mutant clone and a normal clone coexisting. And we treat with interferon or interferon and arsenic and look at metallurgical response, molecular response, uh, re relapse after discontinuation and transplantation in mice. And to make a long story short, uh, when we look at the molecular response, uh, we have a molecular response to interferon, as you can see here, it's the blue line. So we have a decrease uh, in uh, the mutant uh, JAK2 allele in, in red cells or in platelets or in granulocytes, uh, but it's not complete uh, despite two months, uh, of, uh, two months of interferon treatment. And if you add arsenic on top of interferon, you see uh, that you have a much more profound uh, decrease in the mutant and the mutant allele. And this uh, is reflected in the fact uh, that uh, we can even eradicate the disease in some of the animals and about half of the animals after treatment discontinuation, the disease that doesn't come back, implying that we have targeted the leukemic stem cells in this model. And there is actually some evidence, which I will not present here, that we have an elimination of the leukemic uh, stem cells, uh, probably through a senescence-based mechanism. Uh, what I just want to emphasize today is that this is a PML dependent effect and to study the fact that it's PML dependent, we generated uh, the, the, we generated myeloproliferative neoplasm with a JAK2 uh, mutant knock-in allele on a PML null background and did a, uh, a, a competition study between PML null and PML proficient mice after interferon arsenic treatment. And what you can see is summarized here. Uh, this is the proportion uh, of the mutant allele that is PML null. And as you can see, there is a remarkable enrichment from the original 50 50 uh, equilibrium. You have a sharp progression uh, of the PML null cells on all lineages uh, in the myeloid lineage, uh, in the platelets, in the red blood cells. And this uh, effect is not immediate, but manifested after uh, three months uh, of treatment. Again, implying uh, that the targeting of the leukemia initiating cell by the interferon arsenic therapy implies at least in part PML. And actually the involvement of PML is maximal uh, in the myeloid lineage on the platelet lineage. Uh, you don't have much effect of interferon alone in this setting. However, uh, for the effect on the, clin the most obvious clinical manifestation of the disease on red blood cells, you already have an enrichment with, in with uh, interferon alone, implying uh, that the effect of interferon alone is modestly mediated by PML, but the effect of the active interferon arsenic combination requires really PML uh, for all lineages.
So uh, this demonstrates that arsenic sharply enhances interferon response and will clear disease-initiating cells, allowing the cure of some mice, and that the interferon arsenic response in JAK2 mutant uh, leukemic cells involves a PML-driven senescence. And uh, this was uh, unexpected uh, to me that it was of such high amplitude because it, and it resembles very much the APL model which suggests uh, that PML-driven senescence could be a common effector pathway of therapy in different hematological malignancies, not only in APL, uh, but maybe in a, selected, in a selected subset of leukemias. And uh, the clinical feasibility and tolerance of the interferon arsenic combination has already been demonstrated in ATL patients. It's not toxic, it's very well support, uh, 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 it's very well uh, tolerated by the patients, so that this uh, could drive uh, clinical trials aimed at eradicating uh, uh, myeloproliferative neoplasm, which was something unachievable at the moment. So what I've tried to convince you in these uh, ex two examples is to demonstrate the feasibility of back and forth oscillation between cancer patients and basic science. And I'd like to stress that some cancer cures can be mechanistically explained, and that the APL example stresses the key initial role of patients uh, in the original empirical identification of retinoic and arsenic therapy, and the key role of in vivo study of physiopathology of response in mice in, under, in, able, in a way to, to establish the curative regimen. And so I'd like to argue that after enlightened trial and errors, clinical approaches in cancer research, uh, which have been uh, done in the past 50 years, we should now promote rational combinations based on sound physiopathology. And I'd like to make a provocative statement, uh, which we can maybe discuss in the question and answer. Do we really know how most common anti-cancer chemotherapy actually work? And I would, I would say that I'm not sure that we really know how classic chemotherapy works in patients. And uh, the natural uh, correlate from this is how can we optimize something that we don't understand? And of course, for acute myeloid leukemia, the classic anthracycline uh, aracetazine combination, the so-called three plus five combination, which is the classic treatment all over the world. I don't think we can improve it because I don't think how, that we understand how it's active in these conditions. And so I think that physiopathological modeling of response is critically important also for novel targeted therapy and required uh, for rational combination of these targeted therapies. And finally, just a word to say that I think we need more basic and translation, translational academia-driven science uh, we had therapeutic, uh, it has led to therapeutic paradigm change for some leukemia, and I think that we collecti ha collectively have an open boulevard for drug repurposing and rational combination through the combination of uh, targeted therapy, classic therapy, uh, uh, immunotherapy, and this type of research driven by academia and not by industry, I think should be facilitated and financed. And in closing, I'd like to thank uh, my uh, collaborators uh, and, and, uh, and, and um, funding bodies. Uh, so I'm working partly in Hôpital Saint-Louis. Uh, here it's a 400-year-old hospital established out of the walls uh, in Paris uh, for the pandemics, uh, notably the, 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 the cholera pandemics. Uh, it was really out of the city at the time. It hasn't changed much except that now it's in the middle of the city and in Collège de France. And my work is supported uh, by uh, the Collège de France, the ERC, the CNRS, INSERM, University of Paris, uh, Ligue contre le cancer, Hôpital Saint-Louis. And I've mentioned uh, uh, my uh, all-time uh, collaborator, Valérie Lallemand, who really played a key role uh, in uh, these studies. And I'd be happy to take uh, questions now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Tate. Uh, very fascinating and illuminating talk, um, and especially this idea of uh, how we can, you know, drive the curiosity-driven research uh, from the bench to the bedside. Um, uh, I would 
encourage the participants to uh, put their questions in, in the Q&A chat box. Uh, I don't see any open questions that, thus far, but maybe I can start with a question myself. Um, okay. I just really enjoyed your talk, actually. So I was wondering, actually, especially with what you said about the interferon response, um, have you looked at how the other immune cells are changing? So in terms of immune phenotyping upon arsenic or retinoic acid. So what's happening to the T cells? Is there a TCR, BCR response? Uh, how does that change upon differentiation? Well, I'm not an immunologist, but I have many immunologist friends. And they tell me it's impossible to cure cancer without the immune system. And uh, I'm telling them, maybe you're right, but maybe you're wrong. Uh, in the mice, in the mice models, uh, you have to realize that you eliminate completely the disease in a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm unsure of any possible education, you know, of the immune system in such a time, such a short time period. Sure. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's, I'm not claiming it's the same in patients because in patients, the eradication of the disease takes about three weeks. But in three weeks, you really get to 100% uh, leukemic bone marrow to uh, no, no detectable leukemic cell at all. Uh, so this is something that we are studying slowly because we're not immunologists. Uh, it's possible that there is a contribution. Uh, there were claims that in mouse models, uh, the elimination of the disease, uh, the eradication of the disease is not possible in deeply immunocompromised uh, mice. Uh, mm -hmm. But this was before, this was before the, arsenic, uh, the arsenic time. Uh, so I think it's an open question. Uh, as okay. of course you know, there are there are some, there have been some recent publications uh, that retinoic acid is an important mediator of the the stromal stromal to tumor uh, interplay in uh, in some solid tumors. But this is not something that we have investigated ourselves. Right. I guess I was also thinking more in terms of to promote differentiation, especially in the granular sites. Or, or in some cases, uh, there's some literature with neutrophils as well that, you know, maybe there's an innate response, not necessarily adaptive. I can understand, yeah, to try to have an adaptive immune response would take much longer. It's possible. It's possible. Yeah. I'm, I'm, we're not, not ruling anything out. And again, clinical sure. observations is the key point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, we have some questions coming in. Uh, maybe I can read it to you. So uh, uh, from Wailong Tam, uh, um, thanks, Prof. Tate, for the tour de force demonstration of uh, APL therapy, very inspirational. So what's the role of such differentiation therapy in solid tumors? And why aren't there many concrete successful examples in other cancer types? Well, this is a very good question. Of course, historically, uh, leukemia have been always much more simple uh, than solid tumors. And, and that this is one of the reasons why many of us you know, started, who started in the leukemia field uh, did a little a little uh, promenade in the in the solid tumor field and then found it was too complicated and came back to leukemia. Uh, probably one of the one of the thing is that there's some uh, in in APL in particular APL can be considered as a, a monogenic disease. Uh, there, there are examples of patients in whom for whom uh, uh, deep sequencing did not reveal anything else than PML or ER. It's not, it's not the most common frequent. Uh, very commonly, you have FLT3 activation or other, or other modest oncogene activation. Uh, but we have described some patients with PML or ER alone, period. So it's largely monogenic. And of course, if you kill the main driver, everything collapses. And if you activate PML bodies after you kill the main driver, it's even better. We all know that solid tumors are much more complicated and that they involve uh, several sequential or not sequential activation or, or four to six different major oncogenic pathways. And so I think there are examples of, of differentiation in, in some solid tumors, uh, but it's probably not enough. And I would argue, and actually we wrote a review in, in, in Nature Review some years ago on this, that differentiation in this case should not be the magic bullet. Differentiation can be a small contributor to the, to the success. I think there's one good ex example for this, which is neurobl neuroblastoma. And as you may remember, a neuroblastoma is treated by surgery, chemotherapy. And after that, 
it's given, uh, retinoic acid is given as a differentiation yeah. therapy to fight an invisible disease, you know, essentially, and it works. Yeah. It's not black and white, but it's clinically relevant. You know, the, the relapse rate, if I recall well, go from 50% to 75, uh, from 50% to 25%. So in terms of patients, it's important, but it's coming when everything is done, you know, when you already yeah. have surgery, chemotherapy, and, and so on. And, and my view of differentiation therapy, and I'm actually preparing a review for this now, is that I think we should, the, the model for differentiation therapy was APL for years. And so we all were expecting miracles. But I hope I convinced you that APL is not differentiation therapy. Uh, APL is senescence therapy yeah. with differentiation. And I think that the expectations of differentiation therapy were much too high. And I think differentiation therapy will work, but it will work as a small increment uh, on chemotherapy, on targeted therapy, uh, on surgery, just to increase and kill the last uh, cancer, cancer stem cells. Thank you for that. All right, um, so another question, what's your opinion about the role of PML in mitochondrial adaptation to oxidative stress, which could be induced by arsenic? And also this person would like to know your viewpoint about the mechanism of arsenic uh, on P53 deficient AML. Okay, so two, two different questions. I think Imagine. the work from many good, two, work from many groups uh, has shown that there is a connection uh, between PML and mitochondria. And, and we have not published, uh, but we confirm uh, this importance of PML on mitochondrial status. Uh, so, so very clearly in PML, in, in cells where you don't have PML, in cells where PML nuclear bodies are altered, you have a mitochondrial phenotype uh, for sure, uh, which is manifested at least in part uh, by uh, oxidative, uh, oxidative stress, basal, basal oxidative stress. And this basal oxidative stress can be enhanced uh, by arsenic. Uh, however, I think uh, that our work showing mutations on PML in arsenic-treated patients uh, demonstrate that the key, the key target is arsenic binding to PML and not arsenic uh, poisoning the mitochondria. It may occur, but I don't think it's the main driver uh, for, for the eradication. I mean, the main driver is the master gene and the master gene is PML-RBR as, as the oncogene and PML as the anti-oncogene. Mm -hmm. Now, concerning P53 deficient, uh, so P53 deficient AMLs, I don't know, but P53 deficient APLs have been described. They're extremely rare. They're extremely rare, probably because it's easier to lose one PML allele than to mutate two P53 alleles. And so uh, they're extremely rare, but they are resistant, unfortunately, to everything. They're chemo resistant, arsenic resistant, retinoic acid resistant, and all those patients that I've heard from have died, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so we think that in APL, the mechanism of resistance is much more uh, P PML loss or P PML mutation than P53 loss, even though P53 is a key player in, in the senescence and therapy response. Thank you for that. Um, all right, so have you looked at PML bodies in other subtypes of AML other than APL and Jack mutated NPN? Okay, so this is an interesting question. Uh, sometimes, you know, you should look at very old papers and we published a paper 25 years ago on PML expression in solid tumors, uh, showing that when you go from a normal epithelia to an early cancer, you have a massive induction of PML nuclear body formation, which we now interpret as oxidative stress. And then when the tumor progresses, uh, you have a loss of PML. And this loss of PML could be, uh, could be interpreted now in retrospect as the loss of a senescence checkpoint. Uh, work from several groups uh, in Taiwan, in the US, uh, in China, uh, including that of Pierpaolo uh, Pandolfi, has shown uh, a number of PML degradation pathways which are activated uh, upon a tumor evolution. So in fact, a lot of solid tumors 
uh, will activate, uh, for instance, uh, the casein kinase 2 uh, was shown uh, to degrade PML. And this seems to be important, if I recall well, in lung cancers. And so, so there is a, a relatively prototypical evolution in PML expression with no PML expression in normal epithelial, high PML expression in pre-neoplastic and early neoplastic uh, conditions, and a loss of PML uh, in, in evoluted uh, advanced tumors. Now, with respect to leukemia, there is one setting in which there were P50, uh, PML uh, abnormalities described, which is NPM1C uh, mutant leukemia. This was described in two blood papers, two back-to-back -back blood papers uh, five years ago uh, by, by Bruno Fallini and, and Ali Bazarbashi. Uh, so that it's, it's not as clear it's not as clear cut as APL, but there is definitely some defects in these conditions. Sure. All right. Um, another question from uh, Shara Kapinen. Um, so I was wondering if arsenic effect, um, if the arsenic effect has it been tested in the non jack two mutant MPN diseases? So those that CalR or MPL mutations. Not yet, no, not to my knowledge. All right, um, and and perhaps the last question here from the attendees, Victor Ho. Um, uh, do you have, so I, I might have missed this, but was there any effect of arsenic alone in the MPN model in the JAN paper? And do you have any opinion on innate agonists of RLR agonists or sting agonists as combinatorial treatment in cancer, maybe in PML yes. or other leukemias? Very interesting question. We have not done it, but I think some people should do it. All right. Uh, great. Um, if, if, thank if you. If anyone in Singapore wants to do it, we're ready to collaborate or to help. All right. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, any other questions from the panelists? Um, if not, maybe I have another quick question, actually. Um, I was wondering, um, it was not quite obvious to me. So. In terms of the arsenic binding to PML versus the PML RAR fusion, so yes. is there a determination of specificity what it binds to PML alone or? No, it's the same. It's the same binding site. It's exactly the same. So, it's but exactly is it? Okay. Uh, so, but is the binding? Um, the, does the binding affinities change in the fusion yes, proton we versus PML? No, this we don't really know. We don't really know. Uh, but, you know, if we assume that the key role is to reform PML bodies, you can actually reform PML bodies even with PML or ER. Uh, so there right. will be degradation. And that's what reason why in one of the images I showed in uh, the dual combination uh, with PML and PML or ER, you can see full PML body reformation, even if you still have a little bit of PML or ER remaining there. Uh, yeah. And actually, some with arsenic, some of that PML or ER will be uh, retargeted towards the bodies. So we really mm -hmm. think that the reformation of the bodies is, is, is the driver uh, of, of senescence and, and, and what is really required for therapy, therapy response. All right. Well, um, thank you again uh, for the very uh, illuminating talks. I'm sure there are a number of other questions that perhaps people can reach out to you if they have. Um, sure. And uh, yeah, thank you again for taking the time. Uh, uh, really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure. And I'm, I hope that our next meeting will be uh, not virtual, uh, but will be uh, over there. Exactly. We would love to have you here. <laughs> Thank all you right. so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you all for attending. Um, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.